And tonight we have a tremendous testimony and not only a testimony, but a person that is a powerful minister that's going to come share with you. So let's watch this little video that will introduce Julianne to you. There was so much pain in my body and it came out of nowhere. I started with a lot of lower back pain, I started with pain in my legs, pain in my hands, and then it felt like I had the flu 24-7. They said I had lupus, they said I had fibromyalgia. Fibromyalgia just doesn't come on you. It comes from a lot of years of a lot of emotional abuse on yourself. I chose exercise to rid me of anxiety and fear. I just kept running faster and faster and faster. The older I got, the faster I would run. When I started not feeling well, I couldn't do any of that. So it was really shortly after she stopped, I started noticing a huge change. The word despair is the word I would use. It was like a despair that came around her, and I don't know where that came from. In the mornings, he would leave me as my head would be in my hands, and I'd just be crying. And then he would come home, and he would find me in the same position. When the girls would get home from school, I'd say, okay, what'd you do today? Like, tell me about your day. I don't think I heard any of it. Because I was in so much pain, and I was feeling so sick. And then the fear, always, because I wasn't feeling good, and I was like, God, I hope I can make it through this day, kind of thing. My day planner was filled with doctor appointments. $300,000 on alternative doctors, holistic doctors, they just kept saying, we don't know what to do. Here, take this pill. Here, take this. The healing wasn't coming. The medicine, whatever she would take, wasn't working. She was crying every day. I would say, God, why am I not getting healed? What is wrong? Why are you not healing me? Why? What I do? What do I need to do to get healed? I don't understand. Ladies and gentlemen, Please welcome to the stage, Butch and Julianne Hartman. Praise the Lord. <laughs> awesome. So we got Butch, the husband, out here, and Carly and Sophia, the daughters, they're out here with us. And yes. Man, God has done an awesome work in you. I have to tell you, I'm standing over there crying already. Um, you guys have no idea what this means. It's not just talking. I can talk anywhere. But it's where I'm talking. And it's what has happened since 2008 when I so got So I sick. know you're going to be sharing uh, some yeah. of your testimony and stuff. I'll let you do that. But tell them what's happened since your healing. And you are getting opportunities to minister. you got daily yes. uh, live streams. Tell them what you're doing. So now. because of Andrew... Uh, with all the healing journeys and how this whole ministry has encouraged us in every way, from our entertainment that we do to now what we've just literally have birthed. And this is all, this is all God, Andrew and God. Um, so I just had this idea. I think the order ought to be God and okay, Andrew. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, Andrew, I have to say, when I was sick and I would see you on my screen, I'd say, if I could just touch the hem of his garment of Andrew's garment, not God's, that I would be healed. That's how I, where, I, where I had you in my heart. Um, anyway, so fast forward that now I took, I had this idea, the Lord gave it to me. Trust me, it was not my idea. I'm not that smart. But um, in 2009, um, I was just coming back from uh, going to a neurologist and I really wanted them to find something wrong with my brain because they couldn't find anything wrong. And I'm like, then why do I feel this way? I was really actually depressed about it. I was sitting on my mom's couch and she goes, what do you, what's next? I said, I don't know, but I had this dream last night. And I said that God gave me this dream that I would tell my story with other people on video. And that was it. That and was that, before? This is in 2009. Oh, I hadn't heard this. Yeah. And, so, and I didn't either till a month, about, about six months ago. I'll tell you how. So now, fast forward, 2009. And uh, now we're going into July of 2019. And um, God just gave me this idea of doing healing journeys today, which is taking people from the healing journeys 
and having them go and, well, first of all, it started off with a conference. That all we do is what you guys have seen up here. And we just, we talk about our testimonies, we minister, and then the next person comes up. And at the end of the night, everybody gets prayed for. So that's what we started doing. Well, then COVID hit, and I was really upset because I had a scheduled um, Phoenix conference, and that got canceled. So I'm like, Lord, what do I do? And my girlfriend goes, just do it online, and walks away. And I went, no, I'm not going to do this online. We've got to be with the people. And, uh, well, I went to the Lord about it. And he said, do it online. And I said, how do you do this? And he literally showed me the whole thing. But as I was planning this whole thing, I said, God, why is this so easy? I put on a lot of events. I am the event queen. And they're always so hard and so exhausting. But this one was so easy. So I asked him, I said, why is this so easy? He said, because I showed it to you in 2009. I went, oh, hmm. you did. You already showed this to me. And so just because we think it's supposed to happen right away. So I, you have a daily live so stream. Now. We have a daily live stream. It's called Healing Journeys Today. It's on YouTube. Where are my girls and my men out there? So we start off uh, Sundays with Herman and Raquel. They, we, we call them our pastors. And they yeah. will be sharing yes. this week. So you'll get to hear Raquel. And they are Sundays. Uh, Sunday mornings, that you'll, you'll see the schedule, I'll just tell y'all. Sundays, Monday is the amazing Nikki Ochensky-Weller. <laughs> Tuesdays is me. <laughs> Wednesdays is Nicole Marbach, <laughs> the amazing woman. And Thursdays is Mike Hesh. <laughs> He's so awesome. Fridays is Jeremiah Class. <laughs> with, um, Saturdays is we Zoom Deborah McDermott in from England on Saturdays. Then we go back to Sundays, but we are live every day. That's awesome. Every day. And it's the easiest thing to do. You know why? Well, my commitment's a little bit more, but everybody else's commitment, it's an hour a week. Think about it. And you also need to let them know about Butch. He's okay. an award-winning. So <laughs> Tell them yes. who your husband is. Well, my husband is Butch Hartman who is the most amazing man I've ever met in my entire life. And um, honestly, we've been in entertainment our, well, my whole life, his whole life. He created four television uh, cartoons on Nickelodeon, uh, Fairly Odd Parents, Danny Phantom, Tough Puppy, and Bunsen is a Beast. And we left two years ago to start our own streaming platform, a platform for family-focused entertainment called Oaxis Entertainment. And this is no dark, no nothing. You can hand your kid your iPad or whatever, and say so you can watch anything on OAXIS. And so that's what we are currently doing now, but we also have a kids' network. We do a lot, Andrew. I know you We do that. a lot. But when you've been healed, how do you not give back and want to see other people healed? So that's just a little bit of background yeah. on Julianne Hartman, and she's a very capable minister, so I'm going to turn her loose. Wow, all right. And you're going to be blessed tonight. Thank God you. Bless you. Well, I also have to introduce my two daughters uh, that are uh, also Karis alumni. So we have Sophia Hartman is my, my youngest, and she actually does all of uh, the healing journeys, social media, everything. And then I have our beautiful daughter, Carly Hartman, and she is also, she's, taught our, she's a social media queen who taught the whole family how to do social media. So they both went to Karis Bible College, and uh, this place means a lot to me, like you guys can't even believe. Um, but I have to bring up my husband because my testimony of healing could not be my testimony without my amazing husband. So Butch, can you come up here for a minute? All right, so I've got nine pages of notes, just to tell you. Um, also, as you can tell, I do get really excited. Okay, now here's the problem. Now I can stay up here and control her if you want me yeah. to. So here's the thing. We've been married 28 years, so when I leave this stage, you're all on your own, okay? <laughs> all right, so I like interaction with the audience. So please don't go to sleep, all right? I'm going to keep you awake because I'm going to yell a lot if you don't. All right? And audience all over the world, because I know you are, I need interaction from you too. You guys, you know, we're a small group here, but this is going out to millions of people, and you're just as close as if you were sitting right here in this auditorium. So don't think that it's, well, and listen, 
Right now, I'm going to give you about two seconds to go get some water, go to the bathroom, but be back because I've got some great things to say, and I don't want you to miss it, all right? So as Butch said, we've been married for 28 years, and uh, I was a fitness person, loved to work out my whole life. Um, I was an actress. And she wasn't a fitness person when I married her. She became that after I married her, so it kind of wasn't fair. Like, you know, oh, we have to go work out. We, we didn't know about working out before we got married. It was like, then, then I had to start working out, too. So That was where you're supposed to laugh. Yeah, that was a joke. Okay, just... Look, we're really trying up here, everybody, okay? So help Listen, us out. Let me just give you a disclaimer now. I did stand-up comedy, all right? I'm used to drunk people with no expression, all right? So this is no problem for me, okay? Um, but I, I started off, I, I wanted to be an actress like everybody. I mean, I'm from L.A., right? I'm a native from Los Angeles, from Burbank, California. Um, pray for me, please. That's another place to laugh, okay? Um, anyway, but I wanted to be an actress. I was. I um, didn't do so well. My mother said, you better get a job. So I, she said, you're never going to be the one who's going to wait on tables. You better learn to type. So I did. And uh, because of that, learning how to type, um, I typed 90 words a minute. And because of that, I got a job on the game show Jeopardy. Fourteen and a half years I spent at Jeopardy. Bet you didn't know that about me, did you? Um, what is, where did Julianne work? <laughs> so anyway, um, so I did that, but plus trying to be an actress and all that. And, uh, but I did have something that really haunted me most of my life, and that was called fear. And fear literally was, was behind me and around me and in front of me my whole life. So I chose physical fitness because I didn't know Jesus. He was a cuss word to me. And I'm serious about that. That's all I knew. I didn't know. All I knew is that anybody that I saw that said anything about Jesus was somebody I didn't want to be like. So I was like, well, I'll just be who I am now. So I didn't know anything about the Lord. So I chose physical fitness to exhaust myself every day. So that I, when I went to bed and I was by myself, and here come the thoughts and the bombardment, I would be so tired I would just fall asleep. So I would work out a lot. But I have to tell you, I do love working out. That's one of my favorite things to do. It kind of clears my mind. But I use working out as my Jesus. And that's a big problem. Because working out is great, but it doesn't comfort you. <laughs> he's not, he's, it's not the comforter. It's not, it's not the Prince of Peace. Right? And it was, it was, you know, a lot on my body. Again, loved it, but years and years of doing it, and it starts to break down your body. And so I went from, from that to, um, you know, always working out. Um, I tried everything, you know, in the acting world, from, you know, stand-up comedy, like I said, uh, doing theater, everything that I could. But I always had this thing that kind of chased me, which was fear. I met my husband, and when I met him, you know, he would notice that I would have like these dips, um, you know, what's wrong with you? Oh, I'm depressed. Why? I don't know. I don't know why I was sad. There was a lot of things that were, I wouldn't tell because I didn't know how to, I didn't know how to speak it. I didn't know how to talk about it. And so I would just say, I was depressed. Why? Because that's what every actor says. Because we deal with our business as emotions. So we're like this. We're up, we're down, we're up, we're down. And so my friends and I would get together and we'd be like, hey, how you doing? Oh, I'm depressed. Yeah, me too. Yeah, you're depressed. Yeah, I'm so depressed. Because that's how we felt that if we stayed in those emotions, we'd be really good actors. Isn't that silly? So, so physical fitness was my, was my God. And so um, the good news about it is it kept me in shape. So that was only one good thing about it. So we're married. Everything is going great. We have our daughters. It's awesome life. And um, now I become, anybody remember uh, Billy Blank's Tybo? Raise your hand. I need the interaction. Okay. Well, if you ever, they may do the videos. No, okay. So it was Billy. I was on this side. And his daughter Shelly was on the other. Do you recognize me now? Okay. I don't have the same abs, but trust me. You have they, a, lot more, yeah. a lot more clothing on right yes, now, too. Yes, a lot too. more clothing than I used to wear. So I became a Thai bow instructor. I also became a third-degree black belt in, in, in martial arts. And what, what I did with that was I thought that's how I would fight because I love to fight, like physically. It's so fun. 
to, to fist fight or whatever, or to fight, you know, martial arts and stuff. So I, I chose that on, when I first uh, got diagnosed or got sick, I chose that as a way to fight, was physically fight. But again, I kept, you know, f exhausting myself. And this is prior to us even getting saved. We're not even saved at this point. Yeah. Neither one of us grew up in a Christian home. Um, I think uh, we were in our mid thirties. I was in our, I was 35 when we got saved. Got born. So we've only been saved 20 years. So, you know, that's not a long time. We're like a 20 year old right now, right? But what we did do though, is we were so desperate that we dove in head first. Mm -hmm. And there were people that were in the ministry for, you know, 40 years and, you know, wasn't growing anymore. And I was like, that's really weird. I wonder why. Well, they've just been sitting too long, getting fat on the word and not doing anything with it. And I didn't realize what that was until later, but we really did not have a clue how to do anything. Honestly, I am telling you, we were just, I thought when we walked into, we went to Crenshaw Christian Center. When we walked in there, I thought everybody was perfect. I thought everybody that was a Christian had no problems. They were perfect. And I was the big sinner walking in. What, I mean, that's what, when you don't know, I mean, does this sound crazy to you guys? Sound weird? Well, I really did. I thought, well, they're perfect. How do I become perfect like them? You know, and then they would run, talk about these things called faith. Well, what's that? Mm -hmm. You know, and so we really did not have a clue, but we really, literally, we dove into uh, what, what the Word of God said. And thank God that the pastor, uh, Frederick Casey Price, anybody knows? Who, yeah, Fred, who knows Fred Price in here? Anybody? Yeah. Anybody? Well, we were, by the way, Fred Price's church, um, we stood out in the church. I don't know if you guys, we, it was predom predominantly African-American church. And uh, we, it was really fun because they just adopted us like we were just they part did. of the family. It was awesome. And you want to hear the really freaky thing? You know, Raquel and Herman, we knew them from Crenshaw. Yeah. And Back lost, in the day. And lost touch with them for years until the first, the first year you had uh, in the barn here, the um, summer family. And this woman's on stage going... And she was like, they were rehearsing, and we're back here going, who is that? I'm like, that's Raquel. Who is that? Oh, my God. What is she doing up here? That's how we reunited with Herman. We thought we were the only L.A. folks that ever came up to the top of this mountain, and then there's Raquel and Herman, too. Yeah, it was this pretty was amazing. like our secret place. Yeah. So anyway, so now we're going to fast forward into 2008. Hmm. Um, something very traumatic happened in, my, in our, all of our lives, but my life particularly, and um, I just... Everything I was doing with Taibo ended. So I was very, you know, we did a lot with Taibo. We went all over to every country you can imagine. I got to go to Iraq and Afghanistan and, and work out the troops. I mean, I, we were flying high. And then it all ended one day. And there went Julianne's identity. And that's really what happened um, in 2008. And then from that point forward, it just went like this. Imagine going from working out five, six days a week, six, seven hours a day, traveling everywhere, doing Taibo, sweating, 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 your life is working out, and then it all stops. And not just emotionally, where do you go? Because your job suddenly vanishes, but your physical body, the body that's been going 1,000 miles an hour, suddenly goes down to zero miles an hour. And so that's part of what happened. Well, that's funny because that's what actually a doctor said to me. They said, you know, really a lot of this happened because you suddenly stopped. And what happens is when you're not uh, letting those endorphins come out, then, you know, other hormones are coming in, which is, you know, bringing on depression and all this other stuff, which brought on so much pain in my body. I woke up one day and I had the flu. And it was like, okay, well, the flu didn't go away two weeks later, three weeks later, four weeks later. And I was like, well, I guess I'm just going to have to figure, like, live with this. What the heck is this? And so uh, we had had, I'd gone to a Western doctor and, um, you know, they said, well, I don't know. Not a guy with a cowboy hat, not that. No. I'm talking, no. But they said, we really don't know what this is, but he goes, but here's some, some medication so that the pain will go away. And so I was like, well, what's this? And I'm reading it. And then I went home and I studied and I came back and I made an appointment with him just to tell him, I said, do you know that this causes cancer? And he goes, well, yeah. And I said, so you would give it to me? I've got two young daughters and you would give me a pill that might cause cancer? He said, well, it's one out of a thousand. I said, well, what if I was one of those, that one, that one out of a thousand? How could you live with yourself? And he was like, well, it's really not that dramatic. And I'm like, yes, it is. 
So I said, that's it. I couldn't go back to a Western doctor. And then started my journey with holistic alternative doctors. And we live in Los Angeles, so they're everywhere. <laughs> yes. So a lot of times, there's a lot of new age going on in these doctors. You guys know what I'm talking about? People at home, do you know what I'm talking about? Because it's a real thing. And one other note, insurance does not cover holistic doctors. <laughs> so we ended up spending, like she said in the video, in fact, it was even more, over $300,000 to try and get her healed. And uh, we knew the word at this time. We were like eight, nine years in the word at this time. We'd been, we know how to confess, we know how to believe, we knew faith, we knew this, we knew that, but. But it wasn't working, and I'll tell you why. This is one reason why, and then we're gonna get into the other stuff. I didn't know Jesus. I didn't know Jesus. I knew about him. I knew, I knew all about him. I would read his word, but it was just that. It was like reading a novel. Okay. I even prayed for people and they got healed. Sort of those guys in the Bible that said, hey, these guys are out saying your name and people are getting healed. Who are they? <laughs> right? The name is so powerful, you don't even have to have any knowledge about them. But the problem is, when something like that hits you, you better know Jesus. So now I'm on a journey of trying to find Jesus, but also I'm seeking the world on healing. Because I was scared, I was sick, I was tired, I was exhausted. I was, I was so tired of faking happiness. It used to upset me too, because she'd be miserable at home, and then we'd go meet people and she was happy as could be. And I'd say, why aren't you happy when you're home? You well, know? because remember the acting? I was an actress. I could, I could put on a show for anybody. And the other thing, too, was um, when you are searching and you're desperate, people will begin to take advantage of you. We had a mold person come to our house and tell us that our house was infested with mold. That's why she's sick, because the whole house is full of mold. You've got to tear the entire house apart. So we tore the entire house apart on top of the money we spent on the doctors. And there was probably two spots of mold about this big in the house. That was um, it. I'm glad we redid the house though, it really looks nicer now. But the point is, these people fed on the fear of my wife and I allowed it to happen because I was desperate too. A lot of people in these situations forget about the caretakers in these situations. It's not just about the sick person all the time. I know the sick person's going through it, it's terrible. But there's a person on the other side of that that's a caretaker that has to deal with this situation and try and keep things as normal as possible. And so that's where I was having an issue, was I was trying to keep everything running smoothly while all this was happening to you. And plus, it hurt me to see this happening to you. Yeah. Because I had all this stuff to do at Nickelodeon. I was working at Nickelodeon, doing all these uh, wonderful projects, having a great time all day long, working. I was, I was writing comedy shows all day, and they would come home, and we would deal with the situation. And then you'd come home to the depressed... <laughs> Yeah, I was like, what time is work? Work starts when? I'd be like, yeah, work yeah. starts, you know, that sort of thing. And so it was really a difficult thing. We both had to lean in very, very hard to the word of God. Very hard. Especially me. I had to cast her onto the Lord. First Peter 5, 7 says, cast your cares onto me. She became a care. Not that it was like a burden, like, oh my gosh, she's so terrible. But she became such a care in my heart. I had to clear my heart out. Do you understand what I'm saying? And we have to do that as caretakers. Otherwise, a drowning person will pull the, the person trying to save them will pull them down as well. You have to keep your heart clear. Yeah, and so there was one time that I had, my mom was living in Texas at the time, and uh, I would go and take the girls. I think Butch needed a little break from me, so I would take the girls myself. And um, so I'm there, and my mom would go to work, and she'd have all the TVs on, and it was all on, on Christian television. And uh, this guy kept coming on, this hick from Texas kept coming on. Hi, this is Andrew Womack. Yeah. And I would go like, oh, God, if anybody has insomnia, he's the one to listen to. Right? That's her. I didn't say that, Ann. That's her saying that. So, and then I, would, then I would put him on on her TV as I was trying to fall asleep at night. So that was in 2008. Um, that year when I went there for that summer, uh, my mom, I picked my mom up for lunch, and she hadn't seen me in about two months. And she said, what is wrong with you? And I said, why? And she goes, have you seen your eyes lately? My eyes were yellow. The whites of my eyes were all yellow. She goes, your skin color is horrible. 
And I'm like, well, I don't know what to do, Mom. So I found doctors there. You guys, I had doctors everywhere trying to, you know, find the cure to all of this. Well, when I was there, that one, this particular time, I decided, I think I should leave Butch. This is out. Now, this is the devil, all right? I came home. You know, everybody, we got back home. Girls are there. Him and I, we went grocery shopping. And we're sitting in the car, and he goes, and he was, he was so excited, thinking that this did it. She came back a different person. She's healed. And he looks at me, and he goes, so how are you? I said, I'm not good at all. As a matter of fact, I think I should leave. Or you should leave. But you need to take the girls. Because I am such a bummer to this whole family. And I, you're such a fun guy. I'm just bringing you down every day. And I, and I really believe that the girls would be great without me. You see, these are the lies that we listen to. This is what the devil will start speaking to you and telling you. And he said, he goes, listen, I made a commitment to you. I'm not really happy right now about this, but I will never leave you. I committed to you. Yeah. So that's what I told him, there was your out. I gave it to you, but you stayed, right? So just the same thing, going to these crazy doctors, bringing my daughters. My daughters definitely have probably have some PTSD from this because we went to these doctors. I mean, just they would do like weird tappings all over my arms and my head. And I'll they, never had, they had potions and jars, yeah. and they had Buddha in their lobby, and they had you know all kinds of stuff. That Hindu was just gods floating very on the walls, interesting. and I'm trying yeah. not to look at them. I'm like, no, Jesus, I know you don't really want me here, but I'm afraid. Well, oh, then one doctor would counteract the other doctor. Bottom line is, at the end of the day, we had uh, probably 500 pill bottles on our counter at home. I'd be buttering my toast in the morning, and I kept having to move down the counter because the pill bottles were taking over the counter. And it just started dawning on me, this is not freedom. This is bondage. And all these pill bottles. I mean, it's terrible to have these pill bottles. It's terrible for anyone to have to have all those pill bottles. Yeah. We don't want anyone to have those kind of situations going on. But we were, and then, then we, just, we really got our resolve going then because like, we've, we've got to fight this. And you've got to stop going to these doctors. Yeah, so I will tell you, you know, when you're desperate like that, you'll do anything. You really will. I mean, I, again, I knew about Jesus but I didn't know him personally. And so the world looked, was, was talking much louder than the Holy Spirit was to me, only because I turned that off. And I felt because if I could physically do something, right, that, that, would, that I would feel like I was actually doing something for my healing. And the world has a lot to offer. And I'm not saying for you guys to do what, this is, I wanna give a disclaimer right now. This is Julianne Hartman's story. This isn't your story. And this is my business, and I'm going to tell you what I did. And you guys can listen to it and just write it off and say, I don't care. Or you could take some things, little nuggets, and say, okay, I'm going to go for it. But I'm telling you my story. So I'm not going to give the, dis the disclaimer of, you know, I'm not saying don't go to the doctor. I'm not saying don't take medicine. You know what? I'm not a pastor, so I have nothing to lose. I'm not going to lose my congregation, right? So I'm telling you, I had to draw a line. And I literally did. I drew it one day and I said, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm not going to go and run to three or four doctors a day. That planner, that was my planner. And it was filled. And I'd be on the internet trying to find stuff. But one thing I was doing on the internet that was actually helping me was I would sit like this on my kitchen table. And I'd have WebMD up on my computer. But I'd also have Andrew Womack Ministries. I would sit there with my computer and I'd look at Andrew and I'd say, where are you? Where are you? If you could just pray for me, Andrew. Seriously, you guys. Where, where are you at? Are you from Texas? Are you, where are you? And I need you to pray for me. I need, to get, I need to get out of this house. I've got to do something. I can't live this way anymore. I would talk to him like this as he was teaching me. God wants you well. You've already got it, right? Um, gosh, what else? Better way to pray. Better way to pray. Yeah. Um, all of them. And that's why this is so special to me. 
to think of myself in 2009 after I found him sitting at my kitchen table and saying, where are you? To being up here? Sir, I'm, I'm not kidding you. <laughs> Seriously. I know it made, you know, when you're in the audience, you're like, yeah, that's really sweet. But honestly, if you could see my heart right now, it was an impossibility to be there in a place where you're so lonely and so scared and so devastated and trying to be a mom and trying to be a wife and trying to be all these things. And I didn't even want to be on the earth anymore. But to do all that, to be in front of this computer screen and then 11 years later walk up on a stage. Daniel Amphis has so, I can't even tell you what he did for me every, every Thursday, healing school. I would just, I, whatever I was doing, I would stop everything and I would watch healing school and I would get involved in the worship. Again, I had this side of me, but the other side of me, the, the fear side of me was chasing me into these doctor's offices. So finally it came to a day where I said, that's it. I'm drawing the line. One, well, actually, okay, before that, I did take this one herbs. This doctor said, I know you're really sensitive to everything, so I'm going to give you like half of a half of this Chinese herb. I said, okay. I took it at 7 a.m. And you know what I did before I took it? I undid, I undid it and I even poured half of it out. And I closed it back together and I took it. And I shook for eight hours, uncontrollably. You know, saw that picture and the thing of that video of um, this fountain? I walked around that fountain for hours trying to get this out of my body, drinking a ton of water because I was shaking so bad, thinking, what if I die now? That was it. That was like my, my turning point. And I literally drew the line in the sand. And I said, you know what? I know martial arts, I grapple, I do all this. If I got a military crawl, you know, around, I'm gonna do whatever it takes, but I'm never going back to another doctor again. No more, it's out of the question. I can't do it. How many times were we in ERs? Well, it was many. interesting. We were many in LA, then one time we actually came here. It was our very first trip to Colorado to see a, um, a summer family Bible conference. Julian said, let's go see one of Andrew's conferences. We finally found out where he was. And that's when you were down in Colorado Springs at Elkton. So we go down to Elkton, first time ever there, summer family. Well, this is nice. It was really cool. Hey, what do you guys do around here at lunch? Someone said, you guys should go to the top of Pikes Peak. So we, smartly, got in a car and drove right to the top of Pikes Peak from Elkton. And so uh, you get a little lightheaded when you go up there that quick. She didn't handle it very well. She got very, very sick, and we had to cancel our flight and stay overnight in Colorado because she was in the ER that night, and uh, we had to stay here. And I, was, I, said, I said, let me tell you something. I'm coming up to this mountain no matter what. I don't care what it takes. I don't care if I throw my guts up. I don't care if I pass out. I don't care if I got to go with an IV and I'm holding it. There's nothing stopping me from getting up to this mountain ever again. And that's what I'm telling you guys. You gotta set the stakes high for yourself. You can't give in anymore. And that's what we do. We give in to fear. We give in to anxiety. We give in to what the world has to say. And they don't know Jesus. They don't know him. They may be really smart, and they are. And they know all the stuff in the books. But I know Jesus who's smarter than that. But you gotta, you gotta draw that line and say no more. So by the, by, 2015, mm -hmm. I would say I was completely 100%, not one symptom left. So from 2008 to 2015, we're talking five years ago. That's it. And I mean like completely, not having like a little, you know, thing. So that's something I, I have to show you because the Lord told me to do this. So I just want, so if you guys let's sit there and watch this and go, what did she just show me? This is from the Lord because he told me what to do. Um, when I would see people at these conferences or anybody that knew me, wherever, they'd look at me and they'd do this. Oh my gosh, you're Julianne Hartman. You're on the Healing Journeys videos. Yeah, I am. He goes, let me see. Can I see you walk? Are you still healed? What's going on? So this is what the Lord gave me. Can you play that first video? And go.
As a producer, that iPhone footage looks good on the big screen, I thought. That wasn't bad. That was Pepperdine. And actually, the police were out, and they said that no one could go on the grass. So I made Sophia shoot me anyway on the grass. She's like, we're going to get arrested. I said, God Breaking told me to make this stupid video. I am making it. But I'm serious, though. People ask me that all the time. And you're like, really? Why would you say that? That's so dumb. But anyway, so people here, don't ask that of people. Don't ask people that. Let me see you. Is the tumor gone? Like my cash. Mike, can you take your shirt off? Can I see if that tumor is gone? That's just really dumb. You know what that is? They're saying you don't know what you're talking about. You don't know Jesus. And I mean it. When you see somebody walking around, obviously, that's walking, and you ask them if they're still healed. So anyway, I brought my husband up here. I'm getting in just as much trouble as you because I'm up here with you. So yeah. No, I brought him up here with me because he is the... Well, we both went this, through this together. It wasn't just me, and it was our girls, too. But you know what? We are stronger from it, and thank God for this ministry, because this ministry mm -hmm. changed our whole lives. Mm -hmm. Seriously. Andrew and Jamie, they are life changers. Forever they'll be life changers. So when he does say, and he tells you guys to become partners, he means become partners. When you're a part of this, mm -hmm. a part of this, you get all the benefits from it. You really do. And it's, it is something that you will never regret. It'll be the best investment that you ever made to be partnering and investing in this ministry. So thank you so much, sweetie. Okay, I'm coming. out of here. Okay, thank you. Okay. Now, I do have to drink a little bit of water because we are up 9,000 feet up the mountain, and I do get a little thirsty. So, all right. Also, too, now, before I start this, I just have a disclaimer. I'm not mad, I'm passionate. Did you hear what I said? I want you to repeat it. Julianne's not mad. She's just passionate. Okay, so I'm not mad at you. So when I yell, it's, can you guys pray for my kids? They've dealt with this their whole life. <laughs> They're always go. no, my mom's not mad. She loves you. Oh, really? Um, so I want to talk about, and I brought my notes because I do get so excited, and I don't want to forget anything, because I know that um, as soon as Daniel called me in January and said, hey, we'd like you to talk, that next day I said, okay, Lord, what do you want me to say? And all these last eight months, I've asked him every day. The one good thing that came out of that whole sickness was uh, they wouldn't let me work out anymore, but they said I could walk. And I was like, really, walk me, the Tybo queen? I have to walk? And they said, well, that's all I, that I can have you do because, you know, your, your uh, whole body is shutting down and all this stuff. And so um, your adrenal glands are shot, like they're not even existing anymore. You can walk. So what I did was the first year in 2008, I walked really, okay, here's the word, Andrew. I walked around really pissed off. That's in the Bible, Andrew said. <laughs> I was mad. I was mad. I was like, God, what happened? What did you do? Did you do this? Did I do it? Who did it? What's going on? I can't work out anymore. I can't do the things that I love. I can't be with the people I love. I can't even, I'm like, you know, half stepping it, trying to be a parent and a, and a wife as well. What is going on, God? The whole year, you guys, five days a week. This is so stupid, I'm walking. Do you know who I am? I can like kill people if I wanted to with my martial arts. And I'm walking. After that first year, the Lord said to me one day, he said, because um, I'd come to myself. And he said, are you done? And I said, yes. And he said, can we talk now? And I said, yes. And so that's where my whole journey really began. Because that's the journey, <laughs> the whole answer to all of healing is, Know Jesus. <laughs> Have an intimate relationship with Jesus. You know? I mean, listen, I might be loud and whatever. I'm not going to be as wonderful and as graceful as Nikki Oshinsky Well, Right? And I'm not as poised as beautiful Carrie Pickett. But I'm me. And I'm going to get literally into combat with this because I hate seeing people sick. I absolutely hate it. I can't stand to see it. I am like, the minute someone, I can see someone sick, they don't even have to have a cast on or in a wheelchair. The Lord always shows me someone who's sick all the time. 
and I can't help myself, but I've got to pray for people because I know what it feels like to be in bondage. I know what it feels like to feel like you can't get out of this. I know what it feels like to feel like you're going to be like this the rest of your life, and I hate it. And it's not true. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Amen. And don't listen to that. So the passion comes from just that, that I don't want to see people sick. It just really, really upsets me. And anybody here that's watching online, tonight is it for you. And I mean this. I don't care. Listen, if God can raise people from the dead, you can get out of a wheelchair. If God can raise people from the dead, it can heal the stupid coronavirus. Right? People are so afraid of it. The paranoia. Are you kidding? The paranoia is worse. The devil put fear of being sick throughout the whole world. Everybody question, am I going to get this? Seriously. It's the flu. And I'm not saying that people aren't dying from it. People die from the flu. And this is another thing. Christians are not out praying for people that have coronavirus. Oh, I don't want to get it. Well, I don't have my Bible up here, but I've never read in my Bible to go heal the sick except for the ones that have coronavirus. He said, the scriptures don't change based on what the disease is or the strain. Right? That's what's so, re and you know, we were going to a hospital with John and Connie Tesh, going to this hospital, it's a subacute hospital where everybody there is, has a tracheotomy. Most of them are in comas. But we went every single Sunday for two years and they told us we couldn't come back. That makes me so mad. They wouldn't let us come back because of the virus thing. That's terrible. My heart just broke because, you know, a lot of these people are owned by the state. So they've got no family coming in and praying for them. They don't even have family coming in and saying hello to them. And they, they cut us out. But the paranoia that has swept this country and other countries has got to stop. And the only way that it can stop is if everybody literally gets into their Bible and starts reading the Word of God, understanding their power and authority, and start using it. And quit being afraid. Quit being a sitting duck thinking that you're going to get like the devil's going. Poof, poof, poof. We're so afraid of the devil. You know what? One thing I have to tell you. One thing that I love about the fact that I was not raised in a church and only 20 years ago is that we did not pick up religion. We didn't. That's harder than trying to get someone who's an atheist saved. It is. They're so stuck in their ways. I never believe that anybody who, know, who says they know Jesus, that reads the Bible, does, tells me that healing is not for us. Well, then who's it for? And oh no, they did that. I literally have, we went, one time I went out to, I hope they're not listening, probably wouldn't. But anyway, we went out to lunch with this couple one day and uh, we were, we were, this lady and I were sitting across from each other, Butch and the husband were sitting across there. They're in this conversation and she tells me about, she's got these allergies, uh, they're moving and the dust from all the boxes, you know, she's been really sick. And I said, well, let me pray for you. And she goes, she grabs my hand, honey, that, that doesn't work. And then my husband goes, I heard that, and I knew that was it. That was going to be the end of that lunch. And I went, what do you mean it doesn't work? And she goes, well, I mean, there are some, but God doesn't heal all. And oh my gosh, I, my blood was boiling. If someone took my blood pressure, it, they would have put me in the hospital. I said, why would you say something like that? I said, is it because you, didn't see, you saw somebody die? So you rewrote the, the Bible? Did you tear those pages out? This woman was so religious that she was so stuck in her ways, she was not going to see anything else. Well, guess what? A lot of the body of Christ are like this. I've only been to three churches in my life. One of them never really talked about healing. The, the first one we went to, Fred Price's church, yes, people come up. Every week. Second church, same thing. Third church, eh. What happens with all the sick people? They didn't even do altar calls. So anyway, <laughs> we'll go on with that. But this is what's... So, so we've got men and women behind the pulpit teaching a bunch of lies. Because if you don't tell the whole truth, you're a liar. You really are. 
And someday they are going to be accountable and responsible for what they didn't say. But because of that, that's why we've got a lot of scared people running around with the vi- with, afraid of the virus because no one taught them about Jesus the healer. No one taught them about the power inside of them, which is who? The Holy Spirit. They taught them other things. And just because pastor so-and-so or evangelist so-and-so died an early death with cancer, we all prayed, the church prayed, and it didn't work, now all of a sudden, we don't talk about healing anymore. That is wrong. That is wrong. And, and people out there, you're listening, you need to know, this is wrong. It's wrong thinking. So if you're in a church that's not teaching healing, run away. Run out of that church. I don't care how long you've been there. I'm so tired of like, well, we have friends. Get new ones. Right? Get, get friends that believe like you. And then start a revival. Right? Don't stay there and say, but I just love the pastor and his wife. We get together every Sunday. You know, it's so fun. We have our picnics. Well, you know what? My life, the way it is right now, I don't care about picnics. There are too many people out there dying. Yes, fellowshipping with people is fun, but there's too many people out there dying, and I'm not going to be one of them that's just letting them die without doing something about it. We carry that in us. And if you don't have Christ in you, by the end of tonight, you will. And that goes for you out there, too. Because you cannot walk around anymore afraid, scared, a worldly person that has no hope. Because my hope was in my working out, was in my biceps and my abs. Really? Where's that going to get you? Except being in love with your own body. And that's a problem. So we've got to be careful on who you're hanging out with. You've got to be careful of who is talking to you, who is feeding you. And you know what? I'm going to say this and it's really going to make people mad. Well, of course, churches are not even open right now. But you need to think about the church that you're at. Go online and listen to Andrew. Go to this ministry. There are men, I can guarantee you this is a good ministry. Now you can go to Healing Journeys today, and you can hear from people that have walked through horrible, you're going to die situations. What better to hear from someone that has walked through it than someone that's just up here faking it with the tight jeans, the big old glasses, trying to be cool, wearing the hair a certain way, looking really sexy, so the women out there are lusting on their bodies and not hearing a word they're saying. This cannot be anymore. You know, my Andrew told me, he said, I want you to go for it all. You're hearing it all, Andrew. It's all coming out. But what I love about the fact that I, that I, what I love about the fact that we, I was not churched my whole life. Yes, I miss, I, I, I wish I would have had a relationship with Jesus as a young person. That is for sure. But what I love though, is that I can now, I look from this helicopter view and going, what are these, who are these people? Why? Because Andrew taught me about Jesus. Andrew showed me who he was. He showed me in the Bible. He would, Andrew would always say this, don't take my word for it, look it up yourself. So guess what I did? I looked it up myself. And with now uh, walking every day and talking with him and telling him everything, yes. all of it, yes. even the stuff that you don't think he knows, but he does, right? You tell him all of it and ask him, what do I do about this? What, do you, what is my part in this? And what's your part in this? How do you want me to handle that? God, I didn't like the way I responded at all to that. Why do I respond this way? He's answered every single question that I've ever asked him. And there's this one trail I always go to. I'm telling you, I've watered the plants for years because there's a lot of tears on those trails. A lot of them. Even talking to the point of, you know, they told me that I went into full-blown menopause that, you know, I should have been a little bit older but it just came on really strong. And so instead of doing all the creams and the blow, blah, 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 this stuff, the whatever they want to do now, I don't even know anymore. Instead of doing all that stuff, I said, okay, you cannot tell me that God, that Jesus heals all that, but doesn't heal your hormones. And then I listened to a teaching once from this guy named Andrew Womack that taught about harnessing your emotions. And I went, hmm, harnessing my emotions. Well, 
Menopause makes you have a lot of emotions. Can I get a witness, women? That was a religious thing I just said. Can you girls, nobody here ever experienced menopause? Well, I guess I'm the only one that's being honest here. Anyway, but I decided, okay, I, I did six months of creams and all this stuff. And I was like, this isn't working for me. So I said, okay, I went back to this doctor and I said, give me a list of everything that I don't have enough of or I got too much of. And so he did, and I would walk and I would read this list. And I'd say, okay, uh, progesterone, you know, estrogen, you need to be at this level. And this is what I did. I talked to my body. I walked and I talked and I told my body what it needed because I kept saying, God, I know that you did not make my body. Yes, menopause is a transition, but it wasn't supposed to kill me or make me get divorced. Right? There are times, believe me, I've got this little space in my closet. I had to go in there and scream in a pillow many times because I was so full of heat <laughs> from the sweat and rage for no reason at all. And then when Andrew and I'm, I'm listening to harnessing your emotions, I'm like, okay, so, because the world will tell you, you can't help it. You're gonna go through this and you're gonna be that. And you know what, it's all right, just get a support group so you can all sit and talk about it. And then no one goes anywhere. Nobody grows from this. No one gets out of it. So I said, Lord, you made me. You made these hormones. You did not make it so that I am stuck in this body and I can't get out and I get no relief. I walked that out, you guys. And let me tell you something. Women don't want to hear that. And I'm not condemning anybody. That's why I said, this is my story. So if you get condemned, that's your fault. <laughs> Seriously. But I don't want to hear about all the stuff that we women do for menopause. I close my ears to it, because you know what? Sometimes the, the, the flesh gets a little weak. What if I heard something that might go, hmm, that kind of sounds good. And now I'm maybe see, seeing, well, I'll just go to maybe one doctor that will help me in this situation. Well, that wasn't enough, so let me go to this guy, and then I'm back where I was. I know it, so I won't do it. So I get into arguments with people, women, about this. Because I'm not gonna go and do all the things that are out there. And now you guys, you know, men, I know you'll never understand some of this stuff, but if you've been married, you do understand a little bit of it. But we don't have to go to alternative people to try to make our bodies better. We don't, there's only one person, that's Jesus. There's no other alternative. He is king or he's not. There's no runner-up. Do you hear me, audience? There's no runner-up to Jesus. He's either King Jesus or he's not in your life. So start asking yourself, do I really know him? And it's okay if you, if you go, you know, actually I don't. It's all right if you do. Ask him that. Ask yourself, do I know you? He'll tell you. Because why? He wants you. He wants all of you. He wants you to sit in his lap. He wants you to talk to him every day. He wants to walk with you. He wants to talk with you. He wants to exercise with you. He wants to go to work with you. He wants to drive with you. He wants to be in every part of you. But what we do is we go, you stay over there, and when I need you, I'm going to call you. You know, a friend of mine said one day in our Bible study, and he nailed it for me. I'm like, man, you just answered the question I've asked. When we were in a faith church, which is fine. Right? It's a faith movement. But the problem was, I knew more about faith than I did Jesus. So we exalt faith, but yet we're empty because we don't know Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. You see how the perspective is off? It's, it's off. We've got to know Jesus so that you can understand your faith because he gave that to you. And this is not the same faith of, well, if I put my keys in the car, I know every day that my car is going to start. That's worldly faith. I'm talking about the kind of faith that's going to raise someone from the dead, that's going to heal your body, the one that's going to change the situation in your home, whatever it might be, your relationship, your addictions, all of it. Because no matter what it is, it's an, exaltate, an exaltation above Jesus. And I've, again, if you have any addictions to anything, you're exalting that 
because I had addiction to, to physics, to working out. Here was Jesus. Here was me. This doesn't work. You got to change that. Ask yourself that question. And these are the things that you need to talk with the Lord about. Don't just leave it up to your own, your own uh, brain or your own smart, because you may not have that much smarts in you <laughs> or brain in you. When I get to, with Andrew, with the GTCs, I get to be a prayer counselor. And the one thing that I wanted to cover in this today is the fact of when I'm down there and I'm talking with people, they all, the ones that have been Christians for a long time, they go, okay, hi, my name is Cindy, and I know everything. I've been a Christian for 40 years. I know everything about this, um, but I'm having this issue. I've prayed. I've rebuked. I've confessed. I've done all this. I've done, like, they give me the whole thing, what they've done, and nothing. God has not healed me. And then I ask them, do you know Jesus? Well, yeah, I know Jesus. Do you know him intimately? Uh, I don't know. Well, see, there's the problem. You knew how to do all these things, but you didn't know the one that was actually going to be the one who heals you. But you've done all these things, and you're just yelling out stuff that makes it doesn't even matter what you're saying. You could just go yell at the wall. Nothing's going to change. But when you come from a position of power and authority, things change. They have to change. So all this, I've done this, I've done that, and done this and done that. I don't want to hear it when you come to me. I don't want to hear that because you're not, you can't tell me that God does not heal. It's wrong. You can't say that. So whatever happened in your life, I don't know. It's not my business. But when I was sick, I was, everybody would say to me, wow, Julianne, you're the strongest person I've ever known, you know, uh, verbally and physically. I couldn't believe that you got sick. If I looked up in the dictionary, you know, like health, I'd see your face. How did you get sick? Well, I'll tell you what, they didn't know the condition of my heart. We can say a lot of things, but until it's in your heart, it's really nothing. You're phony. It's a facade. And it's what we do. Do I have a loud voice? Yes. Do I try to, you know, I can stand out because I can yell loud? Yes. But you know who can really stand out? Nikki, who's got this soft voice that sat up here earlier. And it's just as effective as if I am if I'm yelling at you. <laughs> right? So that, so the, the, the confessing and the, all this stuff, forget it. Go, you know, when you're with your husband and you have an intimate relationship, it's the same kind of relationship. It's the one that you two share. You can't live without it. Don't try. It's a waste of your time. And you're going to get too sad because too many things aren't going to work out for you because you don't know him. Am I being clear with this? Seriously. Why would you laugh? <laughs> I'm, I'm, because this is really important. Because I went everywhere. I went around the table many times. Here was Jesus. Here was me. And he sat there the whole time, waiting for me. Did he throw himself on me? No. Did he, did he strike me dead? No. Did he strike sickness on me? No. He's just sitting there waiting. I loved her when she was in the world doing crazy stuff, and I love her now. And he loves me now in my life. If anybody is teaching you that God is punishing you with sickness or disease, smack them in the face because they're liars. Yes. Tell them, I will never listen to you. You are a liar. The devil sent you to say that and he's working through you because you don't know Jesus. These are the kind of things that I hear. And when you pray for enough people, you hear this stuff. And it's true. This is awful. This is wrong. I go back to the man behind the pulpit. Somebody led a sheep astray. Somebody did. So I want you to know, God is not sitting on his throne with a clipboard of, I'm going to heal Daniel in March 2023. 
But what he does know is that Daniel is going to get the revelation of my healing in March 2023. And it grieves his heart that it would be almost three years before that would happen. But because the world is so loud with all the bad doctrine, Daniel may never get there because he's listening too much to this and he's putting so much stock in them that he feels they must be telling me the truth. Why would they lie? You've got to go back to the word. It's the only thing. It's, remember, it's, it's quick and it's sharper than, any, than, than a two-edged sword. Piercing into the marrow. This is not a light word. This is a word that can heal you completely. Completely. Not just be like, blah, 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 blah. Oh, yeah, okay. That was a really nice word. That was really sweet. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that was even sweeter. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Okay. And then you go about your day. And then you wonder why you can't get it. You can't, nothing's changing in your life. You can't get ahead. So the, the, there's three things that we got to be really careful about. Our thoughts, knowing your power, and understanding your authority. Thoughts are a problem. Thoughts will try to kill you because the enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy. And guess how he does it? Right here in your brain. That's one way. That's a big major way. Who are you listening to? Who are you listening to? I want to read you this one scripture. I want you to put that up, uh, Brian. And this is um, 2 Corinthians 10.4. Now, remember, I am passionate, so I like the, the passion translation. Some of you people don't like it, but I want you to hear this. For although we live in the natural realm, we don't wage a military campaign employing human weapons, using manipulation to achieve our aims. Instead, our spiritual weapons are energized with divine power to effectively dismantle, I love that word, dismantle the defenses behind which people hide. Is this good? We can, here's another one, demolish every deceptive fantasy that opposes God and break through every arrogant attitude that is raised up in defiance of the true knowledge of God. We capture like prisoners of war every thought and insist that it bow in obedience to the anointed one. This is powerful. You guys should be cheering by now. Since we are armed with such dynamic weaponry, we stand ready to punish any trace of rebellion as soon as you choose complete obedience. This is powerful. I love these words. Defiance. We capture like prisoners of war. We don't let those thoughts just go. And I know that Kenneth Hagin or one of those guys said, you know, they'll, make, they'll land on your head and then they make a nest. I don't, I don't care about that. They are, they are, they are tormenting you. They're tormenting you. And you have, the, you have the power of the Holy Spirit on the inside of you with your mouth to say no. Amen. To say no. And you'll know that it's a thought from the pit of hell when it doesn't line up to the word. So if you don't know the word, you're going to get confused. And you're going to say this, God, was that you? Was that the devil? Was that me? Who said that? We have to know his voice because we know his word. We can't do that anymore. And people out there, I want you to listen to me. You've got to you take these thoughts captive. You cannot let them run around anymore because they're destroying you. And that is what's making you sick. And that's what's making you stay in a place of bondage where you feel like you can't get out. Make sure that who you're hanging out with isn't feeding your, isn't the one feeding your thoughts with all this trash. And that's exactly what it is. So you've got to take control of these thoughts. You cannot allow them to run rampant in your mind anymore. Nicole Marbach is awesome. That's what she talks about. Jeremiah Class, they talk about that because they got tormented in their minds. And guess what? When you get the mind in control through the word of God, the body just seems to get healed. Isn't that interesting? But when the mind is sick, the body is sicker. So I'm, I'm telling you these things 
You know, you might go home and as you're driving, you're like, God, she was like, I wouldn't listen to her again. I'm not speaking anything else but truth. You may not like my delivery. You may not even like my red hair. I don't care. But I am telling you truth. And you've got to get that in your heart, sewn into your heart. Can you put up Romans 8.11 in the New King James? Sorry, I threw that on him. And I left my phone down there with the scripture. Okay, here we go. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. Now, here I want to ask you a question. Does everybody here have the spirit dwelling on the inside of you? Raise your hand. All right. People out there, raise your hand right now. Does the spirit of God dwell in you? Because if it doesn't, we can take care of that right now. Because that's where your power is. So, but if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through a spirit who dwells in you. You have the power of the Holy Spirit on the inside of you. Do a study on what that means. Don't just take the person up here's word for it. Find out what does that mean? Because your power has no power. His power is all power. I want you to start thinking about this. Walk by somebody who you see is sick and start and, and just say, my shadow should heal that person. But we think of ourselves so low. And we're looking for, did they get healed? Did they not? You know what? The first time I had an opportunity to go pray with someone who was dead, the guy had been in a terrible car accident. His body wasn't even, I don't know how they put that body together. But I said, I don't care. I'm going anyway to that mortuary. And I'm going to do what God told me to do. And that was hard for me. I'd never seen a dead body in my life. Except for my own when I was in the world. That's a joke. <laughs> so I went in there and I looked at him. I'm like, okay, I've got to get rid of my fleshy feelings right now and get out of my emotions. And we tried to call that, ba- that man back to life. It didn't work, but that didn't stop me. I'm going to do it again. I'm going to keep doing it because I'm going to see it someday. But I'm not, and Andrew was so right when he said this because I would say, you know, in my home doing nothing. I love going out on the streets and praying for people. Jeremiah and I have this thing. We love to go out on the streets with people. God, that's where you get so much knowledge and you get like, man, you get filled. You feel like a giant when you're on the streets praying with strangers because they're the ones who are like, who are you, freak? Get away. And you're like, yes. That's exciting. But those are the, you, we've got to do that. Andrew said one time, how are you going to know if you can raise someone from the dead or not if you're just sitting in your house reading about it? Go out and do it. Andrew, everything you told me to do, I did. And not everybody's going to do that. And I wish that people would listen to me too, but not everybody here is going to listen. Maybe half of you, maybe a quarter of you. But he told me that. That's one thing that I might have been out in the world doing some crazy things before Jesus. But whatever Jesus told me to do when I met him 20 years ago, I have done. So if you've got that raising from the dead faith, why are you sitting here sick? Allowing the sickness to take you over. So now think of it this way. You've got all the power in a, uh, the power on the inside of you. Not your power. Who here has tried to pray for people with your own power? You feel like an idiot, don't you? <laughs> this was so stupid. This was all me, none of him, right? So you've got all this power on the inside of you. Where does the authority come from? Well, something's got to come out of your mouth. So the power of the Holy Spirit... Because of that, you have the authority in your mouth to speak things into existence. That's why if you go, well, I did what Julianne did, and I walked in my house, and I confessed, and I rebuked, and all this, and nothing happened. I can't believe this hasn't happened. Maybe he does it for some and not for all. No, you didn't understand the power on the inside of you. Because right now you're just speaking words. The word of God that you're confessing isn't even working because there's nothing behind it. It's just words. You might as well just go take a novel and read that in the hallways of your house. The word is powerful. It is powerful. 
And the word is the only thing that's going to change situations. It's only going to change your life. Nothing else will. So you've got the power of the Holy Spirit and your mouth, your body is given the authority on this earth to use that power to make a change, to stop things, to change, to heal, to whatever. So now when you are going to confess and now when you're going to rebuke and now when you're going to command, now it's coming from somewhere and it has to change. It has to change. I did it myself. I'm not up here saying that I heard somebody one day do it. I did it. Andrew told me that he showed me in the Bible where it says, whoever says this mountain be removed and be cast in the sea, he doesn't doubt in his heart, he shall have whatever he says. I never forget, Andrew, I'm in my kitchen, I'm cooking, and you said, you've already got everything that you need. And I went, what? Because you're on my computer, what? It's that easy? And I've been running around this mountain I was like, okay, well, my walks, my back would hurt so bad, my legs would hurt so bad, and I would just put my hands on my back as I would walk, and I'd say, in the name of Jesus, back, you better stop this now, you stop that spasming, that pain better get out of my body right now, because you have no right to be on my body, whatever it was, that's what I, I spoke over myself. And when it finally got deposited on the inside of my heart, everything changed. Everything changed. I would have, one time I had this red thing, I don't know where it came from, it just came up on my arm. I said, what the heck is that? I said, oh no, no, no. I sucked my finger and I said, I curse you and you better die right now at the root. Don't you ever come back. It took three days, it was completely gone. Because I, why? Because of the power in me, it's not me. I am nobody. If you knew, if, if I had my sister sitting here, they'd say, oh God, she was a, she was an idiot. She was a pain growing up. So it's not me. Jesus changed everything in my life. It's not me. You guys wouldn't even like me if you knew me back then. I mean it. You don't even really know me, so you don't really, I don't know if you would or not, but I mean it. That's how, how life-changing he is. Don't settle for anything else. Don't settle for an imposter. Don't settle for this busyness so that you never get a relationship with Jesus, so you don't even know who he is, and when you don't get healed, you go tell the world he doesn't work. Because that's what people are banking on. Well, so-and-so said he did, did, God doesn't work. They prayed and it didn't work. I feel this way. I know that God says when I pray that I believe I receive and I have. So if I pray for you, I know that your body received healing right then. I know it. And then you're at this conference, you know, usually there's 3,000 people and everybody's excited. And it was like, I'm healed, I'm healed, I'm healed. They get out the door, they start getting to the airport. Oh, my back hurts. Wait a minute, I got healed at that prayer line. What just happened? Oh no. Oh my God, now all the, all the symptoms are back. What's going to take is your, your, your faith and your knowing that you were healed. You were healed when you said yes to Jesus. You just didn't know it. But now I took like, you know when you put the, on the battery, you charge the battery, the jumper cables? Now you know those jumper cables went in, poof. That's all it did. It just kind of shook you. But it, it shook up what was on the inside of you. That's all it did. So now when you start to leave here and you feel a symptom, well, that didn't work. That is not true. That's what the enemy is trying to do to you. He's trying to lie to you to keep you down so that you will never talk about Jesus, ever. And then you'll tell everybody, well, so-and-so didn't get healed. You know what? I don't care anymore. I love people and I want to see everybody healed. But I can't look at somebody else not getting healed and it's going to dictate my faith and my future. You need to feel the same way too. I'm not telling you guys to, to I, I don't want you guys to think I'm condemning you, please. Because that's not what this is about. Because I didn't say this, but God did. He said there's no condemnation for you if you're in Christ. So don't let that. But just let this pique your interest a little bit tonight. 
This is all about Jesus. It is about him 100%. It's not about you. It's not about your friends. It's not about your family. It's about nothing but Jesus. And if it's anything else, then he's runner up. There's a song that I want my daughter to come up and play. This song means so much to me because when, I'm, when I've gone through some things and I was tempted to look at something physical in my body, tempted for a minute, this song says, um, turn your eyes upon Jesus. And this is the one lyric I love. Look full in his wonderful face. Full. This is my screen. Look full in his face. Don't let anything peripheral get in there. Look full in his face. And the things of the world will grow strangely dim. But you've got to look full in his face. Please don't. Don't let the world seep in. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. You know, I wasn't raised with, I don't know, is this a hymn, Daniel? Chorus. Was it? Okay, I don't even know. But I heard it one time, and I said, that's what, that's what I need. I need to turn my eyes upon Jesus and look full in his face and not let the outside world try to tell me whether I'm healed or I'm set free or whatever it is. I got to look full in his face. And I am, I am, you know, the Bible says, I beseech you, I implore you. I'm imploring you to look full in his face. I don't care what's going on. Look full in his face. And don't, I don't even if, it has, if it's all the political weird stuff, or if it's the virus stuff, or any of this stuff, look full in his face. Don't look anywhere else. People at home, I want you to look full in his face right now. Shut down whatever is distracting you at home. Look full in his face. And if you can't see his face, ask him. Say, I want to see your face. Show me your face. Nikki is not an exception. If you want Jesus to talk to you, you need to talk to him. He is not sitting there with his arms folded saying, figure it out, Julianne. He wouldn't do that. That's not the Jesus I know. I am asking you to look full in his face tonight with whatever it is you have going on. I don't care what it is, but don't get stuck in a mindset that this is your lot in life and this is the way you're going to be forever because that's also a lie. Aren't you tired of listening to lies by now? Man, I've heard all the lies and I don't want to hear them anymore. And I know when they're lies. But sometimes our flesh gets weak and we go, let me sit under the lie for a minute. Let me start condemning myself. You know, I love that scripture in the Bible. I think it's 1 John 3.20 that says, if your heart condemns you, God is greater than your heart. I could be totally wrong on that scripture. I was right. Praise God. But think about it. If your heart condemns you, and your heart will try. God is greater than your heart. Don't allow your own heart to stop what Jesus wants to do in your heart. Go ahead and sing it. Of it. 
You know, the one thing that Jesus demonstrated the most in his three-year ministry was the one thing that most people won't talk about. He demonstrated healing. And it's very interesting how it doesn't get talked about a lot. So if anybody here is sick in your body, I'm going to pray for you. But first, if anybody here does not know Jesus, I want to pray for you as well. And if you're not filled with the Holy Spirit, you're really missing out. It's like you buy yourself a Rolls Royce and it looks so good. And you smell that Corinthian leather and it's like beautiful. And you get inside and you look so good inside and it smells so good. But you don't have the key to turn it on. You can't drive it. Really, that's, that's what life is like without the Holy Spirit. So you look good. I'm a Christian. Yeah, I'm a Christian. Wow. Where's your power? Because you're going to need it. In this world we're living in right now, and whatever is to come, you're going to need it. So who here has not been filled with the Holy Spirit speaking in tongues? Raise your hand. Perfect. Where's my friend Roger? Oh, there you are, Roger. We were a tag team at Summer Family. Will, will you work with them? Okay. But people online right now, I want you just to close your eyes. Because the reason I'm telling you to do that is so that you won't look at yourself and feel really stupid. Or you won't look at the person next to you and go, well, you sound weird. Right? Because it is going to sound weird. I tried so many times and I'm like, this is really too much for me. I don't know what they're saying. I thought they were speaking in Latin first at the church. I didn't know what was going on. So I am telling you right now, this is your night, everybody here. It's your night online. It's your night here in this place. I want you to close your eyes. And I'm going to pray the Holy Spirit right now. Holy Spirit, we just thank you and we welcome you into the life of these people in such a way that they will never be the same again that they now will connect with their heavenly language to you, that only you and them can understand, that only you and them can, can converse and talk and understand each other. So right now, in the name of Jesus, I command that Holy Spirit fire to go on the inside of you, wherever you are inside here, inside or watching this live stream, to open your mouth and start speaking now in Jesus' name. Don't you hold back. There is no reason to hold back. This is not a time to do that. Don't you dare draw back. This is not the time. It's time for you to be bold now. It's time for you to have that, that confidence, that courage to say now. Start speaking in tongues. Everybody here, start praying in tongues now. Help your people out online that are watching this. Tonight and, excuse me, five years from now. You never know who's going to be watching this broadcast. You never know. But, they, but there are people in their homes, anxiety-ridden, scared, suicidal. They don't have any power. They don't know what to do. <coughs> See, I get so passionate that I lose all the voice, my voice. But I don't care. Because I know that God is so good and he's so real and he loves you so much. So did you all speak in tongues? Online audience? Raise your hand. Give me a thumbs up. Give me a thumbs up online. Send me a heart. Do something. Let us know that you now speak in tongues and that is what's going to turn on your car now, your Rolls Royce, whatever that you were wanting. Does anybody here not know Jesus? All right. Does anybody here not know Jesus the way I talked about Jesus? Don't be like one of those Christians that go like, I don't want anybody to see me raise my hand because then they're going to judge me. All right. Well, if you guys are telling me the truth, well, then I'm going to talk to you out there. If you don't have an intimate relationship with Jesus, tonight is it. You don't have a minute to waste. So, Father, I thank you right now 
that whoever is watching this show that does not know you, literally, that you show up in their room, wherever they are. The presence of God is so strong in them that they cannot deny that it's you. They cannot be without this. You are the Prince of Peace. And that's how we know whoosh, in the room where everything stops and peace comes in. So I thank you, Father, for everybody out there from, again, tonight to five years from now that is listening to this and says, I will have an intimate one-on-one -on -one relationship with my Savior, and I will never go back to having a neighbor kind of a relationship only when I need him. No more. Tonight is it. We've seen that one more time. Now, some of you guys might know this song because it's like a hymn or something, but I don't know hymns because I wasn't raised in a church. But I want you to sing this again, and I want you to sing it loud. I cannot sing very well, so you can turn off my mic. But seriously, I don't, I can't sing. But I want you to sing this as loud as you can. Don't be afraid. Don't be a religious person and say, well, I sit like this at church and I do this at church and I can't do that because I've never done it. Break out tonight. I want y'all to stand up. Stand up. Break out of this religious shell and sing. Sing to your Savior. Sing and don't leave. Don't leave. Don't leave. This is not the time to leave. Stay. Everybody, let's sing now. Sing, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in His wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow straight. pleasure it is for you guys to even let me use this platform it, it's just it's like I'm in a dream and thank you guys for listening I hope something has changed in your life please one thing go home and write it down let this grow it's a seed let it grow now in your heart so thank you all and we'll see you tomorrow morning Andrew was great, Juliet. Thank you. You know, I just love the body of Christ. No one person is a full expression of God. And when you see all of these different people ministering, it just does something. I think it's great. You got a great spot in the body of Christ. I'm glad was you're a compliment. No, it is. I'm not, I'm nearly the opposite of her. I'm so calm. And yet I love seeing what God's done in your life, and you'll reach people that I'll never reach. Well, actually, Andrew, you have calmed me down because I've always thought I got to yell loud to get people to do things. 
And then you just sit here so quietly and you got me to do things. And I've asked the Lord many times, how do I meet in the middle somewhere? You just need to be yourself. I know, exactly. <laughs> if the whole world was like me, it'd be really boring. <laughs> Put you to sleep. You know, I don't know how to express this. I've, I've never communicated this well, but the older I get, I think what it is, when I was young, I believed that God could do things and I would preach it hoping to see it or something, but it was, I wanted to see it happen through me. But the older I get, I realize that, you know, I'm just a part of the body of Christ and my, you know, I've got an expiration date on me. And I get more joy out of seeing other people get hold of the truth and then go out and share it because, you know, that's the only way that we're ever going to accomplish what Jesus wanted us to do. And so I'm really excited about that. And to hear, we've heard four awesome testimonies today, and we're going to hear four or five more tomorrow, and we've got three more days of this. And I'm just excited. I think it has been a great day.